Welcome, welcome, welcome to what is the final session of the program part, at least, of this edition of the New Cities Summit here in Sao Paulo. Um, I'm very, very excited to present this panel on a topic which I think is absolutely key. I've been asked by lots of journalists uh, what I think are the de is the definition of a human city, and the word include always comes up in my own definition. Um, so before I introduce uh, the panel, which will be uh, led by our friend Ben Heck from Living Cities, I wanted to uh, remind you of a couple of things. First of all, after this, this panel and the closing remarks, um, and we will, be in, we will be announcing the results of our App My City Prize. So the votes are in and we know the winner, so we'll be announcing that right after this. And after our closing remarks, we'll be hosting a cocktail in the foyer of this building, the Auditorio. So we hope you join us for that. Without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Ben, and on our discussion on Include. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. We're excited to be able to have this last plenary session be about one of the most important issues around cities all over the globe, which is how do we ensure that we make them inclusive. And we know that we could build cities, we know that you can play in cities, but you can do all of that without poor people and without immigrants. How can we make sure that you're able to do all that with poor people and immigrants as part of those cities? So that's what this panel is about. Um, we have an amazing panel here. I'm just gonna briefly introduce everybody at the, at the very end is uh, Yi Yumin. And she is the Dean of the Department of Urban Planning and Management um, in China. And uh, she actually created the first urban planning department in, in Public Affairs College in China and is leading their work on urbanization. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, next to her is Michael Keith. And Professor Keith is Professor of Sociology and Immigration Studies at the University of Oxford. And um, he really focuses on uh, the connection, the integration of culture, urbanism, and migration. And next to Michael is Sean McGoffin, the chairman of the board of the Avena Foundation. And uh, Avena is a Latin American-focused foundation that is trying to uh, figure out how can we help communities and nations create uh, shared objectives between business of uh, the social sector and government uh, that creates uh, inclusive cities. And um, to his right is uh, Alfredo Berlinborg. And Alfredo is the chair of the Architecture and Urban Design Department at the Swiss Institute of Technology. And uh, Alfredo really focuses a bunch of his time on how can first world industry work in emerging nations and informal urban areas. And finally, we have um, Aramar Revi, who's the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Um, he is building the first uh, national university in India, in Bangalore, dedicated to urbanization, um, and is involved, a co-author of a uh, post-2015 sustainable development goal of empowering inclusive, productive, and resilient cities. So that's our panel. Um, we try to shake up the norm um, of these panels by having these be just a robust discussion around four issues um, with everyone on the panel. So we're not going to have five minutes of presentations from each of them. We're going to hopefully have a robust conversation with different perspectives on issues from everyone uh, on the panel. Then we ideally will have time left at the end where we can get questions from the audience. So the first question I'd like to put out is to uh, Professor Yumin. Everyone talks about cities being inclusive, but is there, does it make a city more valuable? Are there greater assets when a city is inclusive? And if so, what are they? Uh, 
全世界城市发展的一种最高的一种追求。同时呢，它也可以成为城市发展的一个财富。那么主要是通过以下三个路径。第一个路径呢？ As cidades inclusivas uh, são uh, a, a tendência atual do mundo uh, e que as pessoas buscam a inclusão não somente pela humanidade, mas também para uh, adquirir mais riquezas e seus desenvolvimentos na cidade. Paulo Mendes, uma cidade muito preocupada com os pobres, os pobres e os pobres e os pobres e os pobres. 那么，给这些流动人口和低收入的居民以更多的教育、社会保障和健康的住房。呃，以及阿西达斯，真正的，应该是，呃，提供，呃，健康，呃，给，呃，流动人口和低收入的居民以及，呃，流动人口和低收入的居民以及，呃，流动人口和低收入的居民以及，呃，流动人口和低收入的居民以及，呃，流动人口和低收入的居民以及，呃，流那么，包括中低收入居民的创造性的充分发挥，是一个城市创造财富的最本质的来源。呃，以，导致，这些流动移民和流动贫穷，呃，可以，使，这些人变得更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更加，更低收入居民的就业和创造会给他们增加收入，并且进而增加消费，那么拉动城市的需求，从而促进制造业和服务业的发展。E que a população pobre conseguindo ser cada vez mais inclusa, conseguirão obter cada vez maiores rendas e dessa forma podem consumir cada vez mais. E dessa forma entramos num círculo virtuoso. 其次。包容性城市不仅关注经济增长，更加重要的，它关注社会和谐，关注自然与人的这种包容，建立这种呃友好的环境。那么，这种社会和谐、自然之美的城市是受企业家欢迎的城市，所以企业家大量的进入又会提高城市的创造力。E as cidades inclusas não somente podem enriquecer aquela cidade, mas também torna aquela cidade cada vez mais harmoniosa. Por quê? Porque consegue aliar a harmonia entre a natureza e a população e entre as pessoas também. Isso tornará cada vez mais amigável para com as empresas vindo de fora. Por isso que as empresas investidoras ficam cada vez mais desejosas em investir naquela cidade. Terceiro, 包容性的城市，它关注的不仅是城市自身的发展，它同时也关注城市边缘区或者更远的农村地区的发展。那么，变城市和乡村之间的冲突为城乡的和谐，从而为城市的可持续的长久的发展赢得一个更广泛的活力。As cidades inclusas uh, podem uh, desenvolver não somente as suas próprias cidades, porém também podem influenciar outras cidades ao redor, outras cidades menores, até os campos nas uh, uh, suas proximidades, uh, to tornando uh, toda aquela região cada vez mais harmoniosa. So, despite all the best planning, my translator didn't give me any language I could understand. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be great on moderating what she said. Sean, thank you for helping me. I didn't understand either language, so I, I think I have an unfair advantage <laughs> that I understood the translation. Uh, no, I was, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. And I just wanted to bring to the table the question of, uh, you know, when we look at cities in Latin America, which is where we work, we're Latin American Foundation, uh, we work with 70 cities in the continent. And, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a continent that's known for having a lot of inequality and exclusion. Right. That's one of its, one of the things it's known for on the, on the negative side. Um, and one of the ways that we look at uh, how inclusive a city is, is whether that city produces what we call public goods and services right. that are available to everybody. And what you see in a lot of Latin American cities and probably in a lot of developing cities is that a lot of basic goods and services that you might take for granted in a developed 
country are, are exclusive in the developing cities. And I think that uh, when we see a city that, that's successful in Latin America, it's usually because it's been able to create more public goods, whether it's the private sector or the public sector, but goods that are available, like the park that we're in right now, to right. everybody that are equally accessible. And Michael. But I, th I think we, we, we owe it to ourselves not to be Panglossian about some of this. So th 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 there is a reality to some of the conflicts and confrontations that emerge from right. forms of exclusion, inclusion, and forms of diversity. But I th what a point I would want to make in response to the, the, f the first speaker is that uh, we, we need to understand the city as being frequently paradoxical in the way it works. So some of the places that are characterized by intense forms of conflict also provoke uh, incredible forms of creativity and transcultural exchange. So if you look at London, that is characterized by incredible diversity, an extraordinary range of migrations across the world, precisely those places that sometimes witness some fairly intense confrontation and conflict are now seen as the exemplary form of the, the open city, the, the international city, the cosmopolitan city. So, so these productive frictions between forms of confrontation and the product of outcomes that come after the confrontation, we need to, to remember it. Right, and I, I've already stolen your phrase productive friction since I saw that <laughs> yeah. uh, the last yeah. couple of weeks because <clears throat> I think it's a really powerful uh, concept, which is it's not just that it's a nice idea, it's actually you get a better product. And I think on an earlier panel there was this discussion about uh, more patents going to, uh, to cities and places where you have more artistic Absolutely. people. You know, it's this friction. If everybody was the same income, if everyone was the same demographic, you're simply not going to have as valuable a place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone else want to add to this? Well, I guess, I mean, I, I have a bit of an issue with the framing of, of how, how you set this out, because we have a billion people on the planet who live in informal settlements. I come from a country where 175 million people uh, live in extreme poverty, but, and that's the interesting story, they produce 25% of our GDP. They produce $500 billion of output. So the question is, how can you deal with this apparent contradiction of people living in extremely difficult circumstances? Inadequate housing, right. no water supply, um, often you know, in hunger, and, and being so productive. So I think the core issue here is, that inclusion itself is not an asset. Mm. Cities are about people. Mm -hmm. uh, cities are not about things. Um, you know, a city without people is an archaeological site. Right. So the fundamental asset that you have is people actually working very hard uh, and living um, sometimes a difficult life, uh, which enables these cities and, uh, you know, and, and countries to be able to pull themselves out of poverty. Uh, in some cases, and, uh, you know, and, and do much better than that. But I think that is sort of the core issue for a large number of cities in the world. And when, you know, when we come to Latin America, uh, the questions that we ask, whether we're here in Sao Paulo or Rio, is how do you manage uh, with uh, a Gini of, of 0.6? Because right. you know, we're at 0.35 and we're very worried uh, as inequality rises along with growth. Um, I think those are questions that you have to deal with, whether you're working in city government or uh, in the private sector or in civil society. Alfredo. Yeah, well I come from Caracas. Caracas has been through pretty much hell for the last <laughs> couple of uh, years um, with five police forces, a divided city, five mayors, one uh, uber mayor that has no relationship with the other mayors because he's appointed. And so it's a city in conflict. And you'll see this repeated. I thought it was an unusual case in the world. But as I've traveled now, I've seen Caracas's everywhere. So mm -hmm. if you start to think about this uh, problem, uh, there's a debt. There's really a debt that we have with the citizens. When I used to visit those mayors in Caracas, you would see behind their walls the city map. But suddenly you would see huge white spots on that map. And those wives would say, what's, what's that white spot? And they'd say, it's a green zone. That green zone had 800,000 people of informal dwellers. Right. But he couldn't recognize that officially because then his budget would have to go equally distributed. So we have a huge debt. So when I hear here uh, uh, the, the wonderful ideas that come on, I still don't see the connect. I really don't see it. I see we need a paradigm shift. We need to go 
from quantitative numbers, from re, uh, a rate of returns on our projects and our, our development projects, to a whole new value system of what we're bringing back to the city. So, and I've dedicated my life to that, as you guys know at Urban Think Tank. Uh, putting in cable cars that fly over the city, connect metro lines, formal metro lines, mm -hmm. to hillside communities, um, vertical gymnasiums on four floors, to intensify sports activities in the only public space in favelas, in dense favelas, um, and that's brought down crime rates, kids back to school, diabetes, um, old people can now come down the mountain a two-hour trek in 10 right. minutes. So that's how we do it. But we're not talking about how to design it. We know very well how to manage it. We know how to finance mm -hmm. it. We know how to organize politically. But design is the issue. Uh, we're still caught up on 20th century ideas. We're still in transition phase. We're like uh, Otto Wagner in Vienna in the turn of the century. We're still implementing like 20th century ideals on city planning. We have to really leapfrog, you know? So, so that, that's great. Let's, let's try to uh, pull out a bunch of things that you said there. But I, as you can see, I think we're going to have a lively conversation. There's uh, no, no shy people on the panel. Um, so, so let me just pull out one of the things uh, that was said, and let's start with you, Michael, on this, which is this informal versus formal city. Um, you've heard that re uh, already referred to twice on our panel. You've heard it in earlier panels. What does it really mean for those who don't see it every day? And what, what do you do about it? it can you create any, what, is it, what do you take to take informal and formal and make an inclusive city? I want to pick up Arma's point on that. There's something contradictory here because whereof the state cannot see, thereon you see the boundary line between the formal and the for informal city. Right. I mean, it is the case that um, in commonly uh, in cities across the globe, uh, the majority of people in the city are in the informal sectors, dwelling in uh, houses that, that may be uh, precarious, whether squats, slums, favelas, but also frequently decent homes that have uh, either ambiguous or uncertain property rights or uncertain rights to remain. But it is also the space where livelihoods are generated and sustained, where there's incredible creativity. Uh, and so what this means is the boundary between what is formal and informal is mm -hmm. actually quite, uh, quite malleable, quite permeable. It's almost more of a Mobius strip, if you like, an inside and an outside that is more complex. And I, I think this means that that informal, formal distinction is important, but it can also sometimes obscure as much as it reveals. Mm -hmm. And just if I can explain what I mean by that very quickly, uh, I think we've heard quite a lot uh, about in the last couple of days about our, our invariable search for the golden bullet or the technocratic solution right. to things. Now, I spent 10 years of my life running part of a city. Yeah. And I, we know that frequently there are trade-offs or juggling acts or balancing acts between incommensurable goods. And those trade-offs can be quite hard sometimes. So the two examples I'd give very quickly, one yeah, would be the, the invisible city. We know that as the city changes, it makes some places and spaces visible and some uh, places more, more, more visible. And we saw with Medellin when the discussion that part of what, what you were just saying is about what is made visible. So we need to think about the city of parts and how the geometries, the relationalities of these parts work together, the part and the whole. Mm -hmm. The city is increasingly multi-scalar in that sense. Right. And as we see megacities growing, then the, 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 ge the geometries and the geographies of these multi-scalar relations challenge what it means to think about planning and inclusion. But also, the second point I would make would be that if we're thinking about the city, we know it must be ecologically as well as economically sustainable. And that creates a problem if we think about who is to inherit the ecological problems of, of, t of today, tomorrow. It creates an intergenerational ethical problem. Sure. It makes us think about the past, the present, and the future differently. But also, it means that we, th we think about that relation of parts and wholes differently. And in the same way, we heard about how many thousands of people move every day to the city. Who speaks for the migrants, the people who are arriving, the people who are the human infrastructure, the, the, infra, the inf people are the infrastructure right. of the future city. And the city that is yet to come has to think about the migrants who have not yet arrived, which might actually challenge some of the thinking that we've heard over the last couple of days about participatory democracy and, and rights. So in both of these things, there are balancing acts and trade-offs that we need to think of. So we need to think of the exemplary the exemplary uh, uh, informal city like the Kummela with 
you know, Kumela has 100 million visitors, 2 million people. It's a pop-up megacity that's run right. better, according to the World Bank, than most cities across the world. Exemplary in those forms of informality plays both with, with the, the less advantage, but also it plays in the Guanxi urbanism we see in China at a different level, or some of the other networks that play. So informality is not just about those who don't have, there are informalities about those who have as well. Alfredo, I know you're yeah. dying to get in on this. Well, uh, uh, there'll be a film coming up online on our website on the Kumela. I was there. And the incredible thing of, uh, about the Kumela is that it's an obligated tourism. Either Kumela, uh, Calcutta, or, or it could be even a so favela. So maybe explain, yeah. not everybody knows what, that, what the Kumela is. Kumela maybe is you the, could... greatest, the greatest gathering, human gathering, uh, religious human gathering, Hindu gathering on the, on the, uh, uh, on the Ganges River, um, quite a in, in Alalabad. And it's, One of the Kums, yes. Yeah, and it happens every 12 years. And this year happened to be very special because it was, a, it was the 144th year. So there was, on average, every day, 30 million people mm -hmm. in a pop-up city mm -hmm. that happens as the Ganges uh, sandbanks oh. appear because they, they actually dam the, the Ganges, they don't let it through, and a city appears, and then after the festival, the 30 days or, or 40 days or so, they, they uh, again wash the Ganges through and they've cleaned up the city. And the incredible thing is, is how they, or actually, it's quite uh, self-organized by, by each religious uh, um, uh, organization. But to some extent, there is no distinction between formal and formal because there's just one. Right. Right. And you may call it informal, yeah. but it really is, there, there, there isn't, uh, yeah. you're not trying to overcome, uh, uh, you're not trying to bring the, some people into one or, or, or the other, you're just creating a pop-up and everybody's in the same. Let me, let me clarify the informal formal because it's a, it's a confusing term. Actually, they're both sides of the same coin. No city can survive without, uh, without the informal. In fact, we should all go with our nannies, gardeners, drivers, wants to see where they live. And you will see the, the, the incredible relationship that we're not even aware of. But the other thing is, Informal, formal is not, is not a, a, a dichotomy. Uh, it's actually, informal means information. It, it would be out of formal. <laughs> so, information. That, that, so, these are cities that are in formation. A work in progress. A work I in progress. I wouldn't agree with that completely because the fundamental issue about informality, as far as work is concerned, is basically you have no social protection. Yeah. Right. Uh, your living and working conditions are horrendous. And I mean, I'm pretty sure that most people in this room have a very tangible connection with informality. Mm -hmm. The bulk of the supply chains that link all of the clothes that we wear uh, come from an informal supply chain. And, and, and a lot of, you know, of the largest brands in the world produce with an informal supply chain in many parts of the world. Because work has been informalized. It's been sort of moved away from factories into a whole range of other things. So the informality um, sort of links to work. It also links in some senses to criminalization. Because you have a formal system that believes that a city works in particular ways. Right, right. Uh, that you know, living and working are separate places. Uh, while in actual practice, they're brought together. In, in a household where you, know, you are doing four different jobs, the women and sometimes children are actually working to produce the stuff that we wear. Um, and when you separate that in a planning frame, you create illegality. And when you have illegality that's supported by the rule of law, you have people who are pushed out, sometimes 200,000 of them who are evicted and pushed out. So there is a very tangible mm -hmm. uh, sort of cutting edge, uh, which is very sharp. I'd like to say it's oh. not illegal. I'd like to say it's not illegal because there's a de facto legality. After 30 years or 40 years of living in a place that has no land title, you have some rights. And exactly, and that's a wonderful thing that Latin America has contributed to this debate yeah. and the statues of the city. But in some other parts of the world, that may not necessarily be so. So, I mean, we have this big issue. Sean, then Mike, and I don't... I, Michael. Yeah, I like the idea that we're breaking down the formal-informal yeah. dichotomy because it doesn't really work like that. We right. know it doesn't work like that. Uh, many cities are actually run by the informal sector and, and the, the, the powers that be are sort of fooling themselves thinking that they actually run the show. Mm -hmm. But I think that we can look also at inclusion and say there's different types of inclusion. What right. actually are we talking about? when we talk about include, are we talking about include in decision-making and the formal decision-making structures? 
Are we talking about include in the benefits of the society, the protections, the, what I was calling the, the, the social public goods? Yeah. Um, to me, uh, lots of times, there is inclusion in decision making in these informal uh, uh, structures right. that actually are more important in a lot of neighborhoods than the city hall. Right. But what there isn't is the inclusion in access to goods and services and protections. Which everybody should have, whether, right. whether you consider them to be informal or informal. Right. Uh, uh, let me go to Michael and then Professor Yamin. It's just, it just almost kind of amplifies the point Arama made earlier. These are incredibly productive parts of, of the city. Right. And so the, the connectivities are virtual and real and material. So when you follow objects, when you follow the, the piece of clothing, for example, or you follow the, 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 the things that make us get by every day in, in eating, uh, you, you'll find them rooted to, to draw in kinds of connection, kinds of inclusion that are incredibly important. That doesn't necessarily negate the scale of, of, of the, the, the challenges that we've been talking about as well. Please. Uh, formal, informal, embora, uh, uh, podem ter inclusões uh, uns aos outros. Porém, ainda podemos uh, dividir, fazer uma água divisória entre o formal e o informal. 通常非正式的經濟或者非正式的住房,它產權不清是它的共性,他們的這個財產不能在市場上方便的去交易。Normalmente as pessoas que moram em regiões informais, eles não são proprietários oficialmente daquela casa ou daquele bem. Então há uma dúvida sobre as propriedades. 從而缺乏一個通過市場去贏得增值的空間。E uh, uh, na hora de compra e venda, uh, sempre gera uh, problemas. 第二個呢,非正式的群體通常在城市裡面它缺乏一個生存的基礎,包括健康的飲用水,安全的住房和社會保障。As comunidades informais geralmente têm dificuldade de acesso à água limpa, à moradia ou à educação. 非正式群體的另外一個共性的特徵是缺乏很好的就業和教育。E para as comunidades informais, eles têm dificuldade de acesso a melhores empregos e melhores educações. 因此這些人及其他的家庭缺乏一個上升發展的通道。Isso acaba impedindo o progresso daquelas comunidades. 所以它和正式的经济是可以有界限的。正因为如此,我们才有工作的对象,如何去使它和正式的部分相融合。E é dessa forma que nós dividimos uh, as comunidades formais e informais. E é por isso que nós podemos ajudá-los a sair dessa informalidade. Thank you. So let me pick up on, on, on one of the issues that I think Sean you just raised, but I've heard it now from a few, which is whether it's informal or formal, there's a level of service that everyone should have. And, and when we talked uh, to prepare for this panel, a number of you talked about some really innovative strategies um, where, uh, that were approaches that were intentionally to include people in the delivery of municipal services, although they were non-traditional uh, ways of getting those services delivered. So um, I, I, I know uh, both Alfredo and I know Sean, you have examples of that. Maybe you want to uh, kick that off. All right. Well, I say we're in the last round ecology. We have pretty much, I would say, 10 years uh, before things are overturned. Because, as you might know, informality is the majority. Uh, the majority of the world right. lives in informal uh, sector. So when you see numbers like 1% of, uh, of the country's population takes in 25% of the GDP, then you start to get really worried because what are they giving back? So I'm really worried about the way the city's developing. So therefore, I would say we've got to invent new modes. So if we stick to one good idea, since traffic engineers have always been the ones designing cities, right? And, and uh, let's, let's go back to that 20th century idea. And but let's engage those traffic engineers and make soft landing. So I say the mobility gap is the key idea. Mobility in more terms than just moving around, right? A social mobility, and a, but actually the uh, moving is actually 
inclusiveness, right? So if we go, if we use the idea of mobility, cable cars flying over city, uh, with integrated hubs, exchanging between white bikes, between electric vehicles, between um, shared uh, vehicles, between bicycles, between pedal push, between, you know, this whole integrated, what I call parangole, to use Oiticica, a Brazilian artist's idea. That and, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, to remind us of Levi Strauss when he said that it's Sao Paulo was the most exotic thing he had seen and vibrant, full of iron. I say each city has to design itself uh, with its culture and it, with its character. So we have to go back and use this mobility idea of integrated mobility. We heard Bombardier today doing the elevated train, but we also heard today that, that people in Sao Paulo are appropriating the under belly of the highways with boxing rinks in informal ways, very creative schools. So I'm saying, let's use the whole corridor, the mobility loop corridor, and put everything into it. Put housing, new housing, and make apps that, that, that help us identify issues. Put in um, the mobility tracks, of course, the new hubs, the, the new, um, if, if you want, uh, 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 solar energy collectors. We can use these mobility tracks, which which are open spaces already, to fill them with energy production. And in the end, one thing I want to say, don't develop big tracks and big chunks of city anymore. These huge condominiums of city are the wrong way. We have to go to the Tokyo model, post-war Tokyo model, which is people couldn't pay for the property rights of their big land, so they were subdivided. It was an intentional property right uh, uh, situation. So people subdivided, and that's why you get in Tokyo mini developments. I want mini developers for the city. Everyone to be, to get, as, uh, as the first idea, to get access to the wealth of development. Okay. Sean, let me ask you some specifics that I thought were really intriguing that you had talked about, about um, urban recycling contracts, mm -hmm. uh, community water management districts, those kinds of things that actually mm -hmm. brought the real basics. You know, someone said in an earlier panel, these are all really interesting, but we're trying to get people electricity. We're trying to get yeah, them water. Totally, totally. No, I, I think that uh, it, in sort of recognizing that a lot of these services are done informally by people right now in the city. I mean, you can take re recycling. Right. Recycling is uh, an important service in a city. Uh, what you find in Latin America, and I know in a lot of developing countries, is that it's predominantly carried out informally by people that are completely off the grid, that have no protections, the catadores de lixo, the cartoneros, the waste pickers. Um, what we've seen in Latin America is a movement to organize, and this is led by the, the waste picker communities, yeah. to organize themselves into cooperatives and to formalize their activities um, and to actually, uh, through work, working with partners like, like our foundation, to actually have access to city government and to business so that they can be at the same table and actually negotiate contracts and win contracts. We've seen a, a now in, in Buenos Aires, for example, recently they awarded the city contract for recycling to a waste picker uh, cooperative. Mm. Um, we see the same thing happened in uh, Bogota, in Colombia. And so what, what we'd like to see is more uh, formalization yeah. of the informal services provided that's by the going on anyway. That's going on anyway. And another example is water provision in rural areas and in uh, uh, the, the urban periphery. Many times, neither business, neither the public sector wants to invest to right. go into those areas. It's not, it's not co those cost benefit of analysis that doesn't work. But the people need water. So 80 million Latin Americans get their water from these spontaneously organized community mm. water management districts. Mm that are off the map, nobody knows about them, they're not financed, they don't have any kind of training, and yet they're providing water to 80 million people. Wow. So if you're going, and we've been talking a lot with uh, the, the Inter-American Development Bank about when they go into uh, the country through these big loans, that they include a little bit yeah. to help these people get access to credit, right. get access to, to uh, infrastructure, and to professionalize more what they're already doing. Michael, it's, it's a small point, we shouldn't lose sight of the chance of city-to-city city learning on some of these things. Mm -hmm, when, when I was running part of East London, which has a very close connection between East London and Select, we ran a recycling pro project where people from East London went to Select and set up a, a, 
a social enterprise uh, involved in recycling, but also the expertise that was one way rapidly became two way as some of the ways that social enterprise worked was re-imported back into the UK and the East End of London. And the social enterprise was, was run mostly through uh, British born Bangladeshi NGOs running the re recycling program. So the, the, the potential for two way dialogues around many of these things is actually quite powerful. I'd like to pick up on that. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the idea of creating an urban toolbox. We're reinventing the wheel all the time. Mm -hmm. A sports center here, a sports yeah. center there. Right. Customer, if we open sourced all these things online and we you know, really picked and choose mayors in their four year term could be able to access at least the prototype, right. a proven prototype, and combine them in interesting ways. So, it's, um, maybe you guys know about Henri Lefebvre, it's not Mathieu Lefebvre, but Henri Lefebvre. Um, he said we need a university for the city. We actually have very specific individual it's disciplines. In huh? <laughs> is that Bangalore? Yeah, there it is. That's what I'm building. Uh, Almar's <laughs> building that as yeah. we sit yes. here. So go but, ahead. But no, I think there's a more <laughs> fundamental question here, and that is, is you know, adequate water supply, proper sanitation, even in the city, yeah. power, and today the internet, are these entitlements? And I know we know from 150 years of public health that if you don't provide them, the social cost of doing this, even for the private sector, is much, much higher. So what you're talking about is a coping behavior. Mm -hmm. So if we accept them as entitlements, the question then is, who is going to provide them? The communities themselves, um, a public-private partnership, or the state? And I think that is a central question that one has to answer. Right. Of course, every country and every city actually sort of answers it differently. Mm -hmm. But um, unless we are able to provide basic services universally, Mm -hmm. There is no question, um, at least economically, it's not a good idea at all. Mm -hmm. You cannot maintain an adequate rate of savings and investments if people are putting in large parts of their expenditure as coping behavior to deal with diarrhea because the water supply comes every right. third day, it's contaminated, sure. um, and you don't have adequate toilets. Yeah. So I think, you know, raising the floor universally across the world, and I think Latin America has done a lot in this, mm -hmm. but certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and you know, China has made remarkable sort of uh, you know, leaps in this over the last 20 years, yeah. Yeah. is something that we absolutely have to do. And, 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 and to do that, we have to also make sure that the land markets and the labor markets work in a pro-poor manner. Because the way that we're aggregating uh, you know, resources and capital uh, sort of enables the creation of the greater up. inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Let me pick that up, because I was just in Bangalore at the Institute of Human Settlements, and you go from the airport to the city, you're going to see more than 100 developments saying new lifestyle, uh, aspire to your dream home. All these developments are going to happen, right? On top of communities, behind the billboards, are village agricultural communities that are going to be wiped out by this hot money speculative development. And so the point is here that that cannot be the way. You, uh, in, the, in Delhi's uh, parliament, 70% of the parliamentarians are registered as, as real estate developers you know, as a property manager. So it's really scary that the city becomes speculation, so, pure so speculation. So let me ask... Uh, yeah, maybe one last thing, okay. one last thing. What happens is the complexity of the city... Uh, could you up the energy level a little oh, bit? Because I think people are... People are, people are falling asleep. Sorry. Sorry. Keep going. The, the, the complexity <laughs> of cities, as we know from Saskia Sassen, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> cannot be broken. And it, this informal, formal relationship, right, which is a malleable one, constantly changing, <laughs> negotiating. It's the very pro, uh, example of, of, of actually democracy, in a sense, in conflict and, and resolution and negotiation, like by approximation, right, is actually necessary, and that's what we love about cities. Mm -hmm. And that's what we love about Sao Paulo. If you break that apart, by simplifying development into bite-sized units of buildings, green space, building green space, with no texture and no co uh, um, uh, connectivity, mm -hmm. you've destroyed the very essence of what we're talking about, the human city. So let me ask Professor Yamin a question, because we were talking about India, and I want to focus on China for a minute. You're training the next generation of urban leaders in China. How do you view the role of the government, the state government, the, the national government versus the city and who's responsible for delivering municipal services in an inclusive way? 
的这个你你你的看法是在这个包容方面的服务呢？呃，是这是有怎怎么样一个看法？因为跟跟我们西方是比较不一样。嗯，在中国现在也在。非常努力的去解决这个包容性服务的问题。其实我们试试图政府和企业合作，共同来解决这样一个系统性的难题。那西呢？我们是试图，也，解决这样一个系统性的难题。那西呢？我们是试图，也，解决这样一个系统性的难题。那西呢？我们试图，也，解决这样一个系统性的难题。那西呢？我们试图，也，解决这样一个系统性的难题。那西呢？我们试图，也，解决这样一个系统性中国的城市化过程中的这种这种呃非正规经济的问题，其实已经积累了三十年，所以问题非常严重。呃，仅仅靠政府的力量是不够的，但是政府确实是第一主体。呃，我国呢，现在是在研究关于这个问题的规模化的发展的中国，因为在这三十年的发展中，中国的发展在中国的发展中，中国的发展在中国的发展中，中国的发展在中国的发展中。E o governo chinês está ciente. 首先，我们政府试图通过城市边缘区的规划，现在正在探讨，试图通过边缘区的规划，将非正式的外来的人口和本地的人口进行一个统一的健康住宅的规划，让他们住进，呃。面积比较小，但是仍然是健康的这样的一个住宅当中。呃，以我们政府，是，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，当我们政府，Possam ter uma moradia digna, embora as moradias sejam pequenas. O que nós temos em frente é que nós temos um projeto 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 Uh, nunca chegou a pensar mais seriamente sobre o bem-estar dos migrantes domésticos vindo de outras regiões da China uh, e vindo de outros países e a populações mais pobres locais. Uh, por isso que, com esse repensamento do, dos governos chineses, uh, e isso nós acreditamos que nós podemos estar melhorando os nossos projetos. 那么这样的流动人口的生存状态不仅没有得到改善，而且呢，我们的社会问题也在空间上发生转移，改善的只是本地的小部分人。Porque sem pensar nesse sentido, ah, as o o bem-estar dos migrantes e dos pobres não serão resolvidos e simplesmente jogados de um lugar para outro. 那我们新的规划方案是试图在本地改造的过程中，把一部分住宅给。外地人同时，呃，这个在总量上同时做一个统一的规划，但是呢，由于流动人口他这个收入水平比较低，他不能按照正常的市场价格去购买房屋，这样呢，我们就把这个面积规划的可以小一点，比如说二十平米，那么呢，但是可以一家三口在这里有一个这呃健康的饮用水、健康的单独的卫生卫生间和单独的厨房，所以他有一个体面的生活环境。Então, embora uh, 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 as populações locais não eram consideradas nos projetos dos governos chineses, e agora sim, agora nós estamos uh, fazendo os projetos cada vez pensando nessas populações migrantes, uh, que embora eles tenham uh, ganhos uh, menos favoráveis, uh, porém nós estamos fazendo um projeto de inclusão uh, pensando... Uh, num, num universo mais amplo, uh, numa cidade inteira. Uh, só que, com relação a essa população mais pobre, uh, menos favorecida, uh, nós estamos procurando uh, os móveis de menores áreas, por exemplo, 20 metros quadrados, para um, uma família de, de três pessoas que tenham uma, uma água limpa, que tenha uh, toalete, uh, uh, daquele apartamento sozinho e que tem a cozinha própria, porque muitos moradores não tinham assim toaletes próprios e cozinhas próprias. 在住房建设的同时，在配套相应的这个人们居住所需要的小学、医院、商场等相应的生活设施。
E também há necessidade de pensar uh, em toda a comunidade, porque para toda essa população pobre, eles que moram mais longe, e, então carece de escolas, carece de, de centro de saúde, por isso que os governos têm que construir hospitais, centros de saúde e escolas de, de diversos níveis. 同时创造一个好的生活环境。Então, nesse pensamento de uma forma mais unificada, uh, não somente pensando na população local, mas também pensando nos migrantes, nós poderemos estar atingindo os, os benefícios para toda a população. 那么在整个过程中,规划和公共服务设施是由政府提供的, o governo se responsabiliza pelo planejamento urbano e as instalações públicas. Uh, porém, quem vai construir uh, os uh, apartamentos e as praças poderão ser da iniciativa privada. So let me let me stop though, because I want to make sure we have time to do one last question and have time for for more. Michael, one, yeah, one, 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 one of the, the things I wanted to amplify yeah. from what was just, just said, which has two dimensions. The, Uh, Deng Xiaoping, at the time of the opening up, drew on a, a, a long-standing phrase about crossing the river one stone at a time. And the, one of the things China teaches us, I think, is that sense of experimentation and reflection. So you have a Shenzhen model, a Guangzhou model, a Shanghai model, a Chongqing model. Chongqing has experimented with integrating migrants in a way that's very right. different. So that sense of a reflexive system. But also it ties back to some of the things we were saying earlier on about Part of that is about reinventing the relationship between land use planning, real estate valuation, local government uh, coordination, private and public sectors in ways where we experiment and think about the, the translation of different values across architects and planners, reinvent some of the professions. And I think that there is an extraordinarily rich strand of material that we can actually, again, t take forward on an international basis. I think Next. there's some, oh sorry. So can I offer us Please. You know, something that might make sense in Sao Paulo? We heard about the Sao Paulo mayor actually having to meet numerical targets. And that is, if you're really looking at economic inclusion, we're talking about convergence. Now what does that mean in practice? It means that the, per cap the real per capita income of the lower two deciles grows at a faster rate than the average. So if China, if China is doing 10% growth, that means the poorer people in the cities are doing 12% or 14% growth. It's only mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. because the saving rates are quite high in China, 30% plus, that you can enable people not only to move out of poverty, but to have the savings to be able to make sure that the next generation doesn't reproduce the same. That is the core principle of inclusion that you're actually able to grow faster mm -hmm. than uh, the upper two cohorts. And that, I think, is a fundamental challenge of dealing with both inequality um, and, and you know, dealing with poverty simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But there is a book here about Rossini, I think it was, or, Don, or actually uh, uh, Santa Marta, I believe, that there was a study between 30 years time World Bank where they showed that there was no upward mobility in 30 years time. So the favelador was not actually better off at, uh, 30 years later. So there is a stagnation despite the growth of Brazil. So there's a disconnect. Now, I think we can come to terms with some principles that could apply across the world. Mm -hmm. So no green field. Uh, uh, development anymore. No agriculture land transformed to, into buildings. I mean, Switzerland already took that decision and a lot of people can follow. I think that's a very good advice. Next, brownfield development, of course. Next, in, in line, um, infrastructure to the poorest neighborhoods of, of the city. Focus of a certain percentage of GDP to just that task of bringing infrastructure to those neighborhoods. And the list can go on and we can compile about 15 Uh, um, uh, key items mm -hmm. that should be respected across the board. A project comes into City Hall that it doesn't respect those 15 things, doesn't produce 30% of energy to be a, a, a little bit autonomous off the grid. It doesn't go, it doesn't fly, it's not inclusive because it doesn't, it doesn't have incorporated you know, a certain percent of low income with high income, with job creations, and it, and it just doesn't fly. I mean, how easy can it be? So let me ask one last question, and hopefully we'll have time to open it up. And I start this off with you, Sean, if we can, which is, what is the role of the business community in creating an inclusive city? 
I mean, is it pie in the sky? Are we just saying, well, the interests of, uh, of the for-profit and the interests of an inclusive city are hard to, uh, uh, hard to make real? What's been your experience? No, uh, I don't think so at all. I mean, obviously, there's always a battle of interest in, right. in a city. You know, it gets very heated. But, uh, you know, a business person interacts with the city just like all of us in different ways. And um, I think that what we've seen working with civic movements in 70 different cities in Latin America is that the business people in every city are different, obviously. Mm -hmm, right. uh, their interests are different. They're organized differently. So you have to respect that in each place. Um, but I think business interacts, I could say, maybe three ways that I could highlight. One is as a citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my kids are in these schools. I have to go, r drive down these streets. So I, as a citizen, want to know how I can turn my city around, make it better. And that's what we see in these citizen movements. Many of them were started or are being led by business people or business groups. Come on, Nossa São Paulo that was here, uh, right. that was presented here. Um, excellent example. Much, much of that mobilization started with a group of business people. Mm -hmm. And we see that lots of times these movements that are led by business people, whether it's in Sao Paulo, whether it's in Colombia, uh, uh, they have a certain uh, ability to mobilize that is uh, uh, impressive as compared to other groups that might want to do the same. The problem is that they, you have to work with them to make sure that they're including everybody. Right. You know, because the, lots of times business people have much more access to power than than the, the normal people. So if you really want those things to work, you have to work with conclusion. Yeah. Just to uh, me, okay. mention the other two really fast. Um, the other thing is that I think business people realize that exclusion is bad for business. Right. And we have a lot of examples of this. We can look at this, the, the Turkey stock market mm -hmm. in the last week <laughs> right. when they lost 10% of the value uh, due to uh, not including people in decision making right. in the city. I mean, that is hard fact. Right. People lost a lot of direct money result. Of direct result. Or you look at the UPPs in Rio mm -hmm. that have increased the value of that city for all kinds of businesses uh, because they said it's not right that some people in the city are excluded. They don't have security. They have, you know, uh, 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 they can't come in and out of their communities. So uh, an inclusive question became actually an economic question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll mention really quickly is that inclusion is increasingly very good business. Right. Um, you see now, where is all the business investment migrating to the emerging economies? Right. Uh, it's more, Africa is growing so fast. You know, Ethiopia is going like 12% yeah. a year. Mm -hmm. And why? Because that is where the growth is coming from. Oh, let, yeah, let me, and let so me that's that. good business to figure out how do you get services to those people. Uh, let me throw some of Please. that. Business, because I am market friendly. Right. The problem is the European technology is too expensive for the South, for the global South. Schindler elevators, too expensive. Uh, Doppelmayr cable cars, too expensive. They need to be redesigned. Uh, water meters, electrical meters, uh, Siemens, too expensive. They need to be brought down. However, all of those CEOs know very well that the market's in the South. That's the growing, most of the growing population. So the whole interesting moment here is that we need to redesign the products. The products need to be shifted to reach market. That's a huge opportunity. Now, who's going to fund that? We need to fund the initial period of design, the incubation of design. People will only go once the design is ready. But the problem is no one's funding the initial part. There are lots of ideas, but no one gets them to market. I'm and being told we're running out of time, am I right? Mm -hmm. uh, the clock's running. Oh, it says 10 minutes. Do we have 10 minutes? No? We have five minutes. Okay, we have five minutes. <laughs> we negotiated five extra minutes. Um, let me see, is anybody want to make one last remark uh, about the uh, business engagement in, in, in inclusion? Well, the thing that I'll say is that the informal sector and poor people are actually remarkably good business people. If you're getting interest rates at 18 to 24 uh, percent and you're managing a very complex supply chain with lots of risks and you're managing to survive, you're really very good. That's one part of it. The second thing is poor people very often pay much more for the services, whether it's water or power, than other people. Right. So that's a tremendous opportunity there to actually deliver services much more effectively. Exactly. So that's, that's a win-win on both sides. Definitely. And talking about high technology, uh, one of the largest segments in the informal service industry in Indian cities 
is people who sell SIM cards. Mm. And, and how is that sold? That's sold on the informal market. It's not through some fantastic retail chain store. And it generates employment and it generates lots of revenue for the large cell phone companies and the people who build the infrastructure who've been here for the last two days. So that, that's a direct linkage of the multipliers that you see once you bring these two systems together and not confused in your mind uh, about how you know, these things are actually separate. They're all sort of very well integrated uh, in a different way uh, than we would expect to. So there's, there's a great opportunity there. Any last word? Michael. Two, two last words, okay. both, both from Samuel Beckett, actually. <laughs> One is the importance of this, of the experimentation. And Beckett says, fail again, fail better. Right. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. And I guess maybe your last word. Beckett also says we should aspire to go in our lives from silence to silence. So. We'll end on that. Thank you. Thank the panel very much. Thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. That was a great panel, and I'm really glad that we.